Acts chapter 17 this morning. Acts chapter 17. We're going with Paul this morning to Mars Hill. Mars Hill. This is the big showdown in Athens. The showdown in Athens. There's a lot of thoughts, a lot of teaching uh, in this passage on this confrontation that Paul had with all of these philosophers. Uh, these people who either lived for pleasures or said, no, we're not doing that, but they followed all these people from hundreds of years before these Greek philosophers. And the conjecture and teaching has been made that Paul stumbled in this place of Athens. And over the year, I mean, I've been taught that. But, and I've even probably preached that. But this morning, I'm taking it all back. I'm not going there. Uh-uh, I am not. Uh, I think he did a marvelous job. I think people are unhappy because he didn't get the results that they think he ought to, should have gotten. I mean, when Paul went places, churches were formed, and lots of people got saved, and woohoo! And, that, and that's what we ought to do. But in Athens, that did not happen. But he did get souls in Athens. I'll tell you one thing. All the times I've gone out door knocking, I would be very happy to have won that many souls every night that I went out. Doesn't happen. You still want a bunch of people to Christ in Athens. Who am I to judge? We're going to see this one. His message was a marvelous message. It was a creation message. We're talking about in Sunday school about the foundation of our salvation is creation. It's Genesis. That's where Paul took them when he spoke. It's marvelous. The showdown in Athens. We're going to be looking this morning at Acts 17, 16 through 34. So let us pray and ask God's help and direction, and I'll have a neat little story to tell you to begin. Father, we thank you today that we are here in your house. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your blessing which you have bestowed upon us. Father, we know that Israel stumbled because of their blessing and the goodness, and they fell away from you time and again, and I fear that's exactly what has happened in America today. The church has fallen away. We have it so good. So many blessings. Lots of peace and joy and happiness and stuff. And thousands of miles away, it is not that way at all. So help us, Father, to be focused on what's important. Help us to get back to that. Revive us again. Help us. Help us today. Pray that you'll speak to our hearts through this text. It's quite a situation that Paul found himself in there in Athens. An amazing city. Incredible as he took it in, as he looked at what was there. It dazzles the eye. It mesmerizes so we pray that you'll help us to glean precious truth from your word this morning. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for the message. I trust and depend in you to bring this. I do not trust in myself. I look to you and ask that you will give us today what we need to propel us in this day in which we live. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The showdown in Athens. Well, introductory story, G.K. Chesterton, in his book, The Ball and the Cross, tells the story of two Englishmen's unsuccessful attempts to stage a duel. 
One is a volatile atheist named Turnbull who edits a paper appropriately named The Atheist. The other is Evan McKeon, a devout Roman Catholic. Their disagreement and attempts at dueling develop when Turnbull publishes an offensive article about the Virgin Mary and McKeon responds by tossing a brick through the newspaper's window. The remainder of the story is a humorous account of their fantastic dash back and forth across the British Isles in attempted combat. Somehow, no matter how hard they try, they are again and again thwarted. After all, civilized men do not fight over such insignificant matters. Soon, they become the number one fugitives of society. And upon their inevitable capture, both are judged mad and put into an asylum. What becomes apparent is that it is not they who are insane, but their captors and indeed society itself. Chesterton's point is not that men should resort to physical combat over the truth of Christianity. Rather, he is saying that a culture that prides itself on its detached approach to the central issues of life and regards those who approach them otherwise as uncivilized or insane is itself under delusion. So what's the point of all this? What is it like in this world today? What was it like when Paul was in Athens? It was the same identical thing as the story, as it is today, as it was with Paul in Athens. People are fine with you being a Christian, but just don't take it too seriously. Do you find that? When you study history, though, what do we find? We find that the most knowledgeable, the smartest, the greatest individuals hap just happen to be born-again, Bible-believing Christians. The world will even admit that our doctrines are quite interesting, they're even fascinating, but please don't base your life on that stuff. Please don't do that. Paul faces the same thing in Athens, and we've faced this as a church down through the centuries of time. Paul lands in Athens, and he has a major contest with the intellectualism of the people there in Athens. This has the ability this morning, this text has the ability to set our hearts on fire. Paul has made this 200-mile trip to Athens, and he does so without Silas and without Timothy. They are not there. He is there. Here he is. He's in this glorious, historic Athens, famous for the likes of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Epicurus and Zeno. Names we've all heard. Even though 400 years have gone by to the point where Paul stands in Athens, the city is still alive with the historical words and phrases and teachings of these men of the past. Athens was the intellectual capital of the world, much like Oxford was in the 19th century. Even though the Romans controlled the world, the Romans loved everything Greek. So Athens stayed very much alive. In spite of that, Athens was a very empty place. It was living on the memories of the past. Paul comes to a city that was very proud. A city where as you take it in, you would be fascinated and it would be like going on the most wonderful field trip of a lifetime. You would be wowed, but the whole thing was absolutely dead. Brings us to the first point this morning, the prelude. The prelude, verses 16 through 21, 
of Acts 17, beginning in verse number 16. Now, while Paul waited for them, go back to verse 15, who's he waiting for? He's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come to him, come with all speed. Verse 16, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus. That's an area near uh, of Mars Hill, close to the, the big, beautiful Parthenon and Acropolis. May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So here's Paul in Athens, and, and what is he doing? And he's, he's looking around, and he's staring, he's taking this in, he's thinking, he's looking hard and long at what he saw. What did he see? Idols everywhere. Let me jump ahead. 30,000 of them. How many of you uh, like to go downtown when they have the ice sculptures? How many have been there? How many of you have seen it driving by? Uh, I don't know how many there are, maybe 50, but it seems like a lot. Let's try 30,000 in Carlisle. 30,000 ice sculptures all over town. That was Athens. The uh, idols were everywhere. They lined the streets. There were more idols than there were people. Three to one. How do you like that? Y'all get three idols apiece. Okay, out of all of that. Wow. That was the truth. It was a horrible situation. And, and, but the sights really dazzled the eyes. And you saw the Parthenon on the hill and the Acropolis on the hill and all the statues and even the Parthenon Acropolis, all the carvings, amazing culture and artwork went with it all. And as Paul looks at this display of culture past, he was greatly disturbed. We would be too. He was distressed. He might have even been quite angry at what he saw. And as he looked at all of this, what did he see? The biggest spiritual need that he's ever seen in his life. This is a town without Christ totally. I mean, zero. So many ignorant souls that believed in all of these false deities. You know, our hearts would be just like Paul. Our hearts would go out to them. If we would go to a town like that, it might just get us up and going in the, in the way we should go. I remember when I was dating Cindy, one uh, Saturday I took her up to Knobles. You know, people from Virginia, they don't know about Knobles. And so we went up to Knobles, and I vividly remember as if it just happened. Uh, we were standing there at the merry-go-round. And if you've ever been there, they have this, this arm they bring out, and as you go around, if you're on the horse on the outside, you can grab for the rings and see how many rings you can accrue, and you throw them all back at the end. So we're standing there close to that 
that arm thing that comes out, and, and I'm watching the people on the merry-go-round. And I'm watching their faces, and I'm watching the joy and delight of the people, and I said to Cindy, I wonder how many of these people are saved. Probably very few. But they're having the time of their life. That was Athens, man. They were having the time of their life, especially the Epicureans who lived for pleasure. The Stoics, they were the other way around. No, no. So you had a mixed bag going on there. And so after Paul takes all of this in, what does he do? He, he jumps into action. He starts talking to anyone and everyone. He's in the synagogue. He's on the streets. He's talking to anybody, all the religious people, the Jews, the Greeks. And then he's talking to the, the street variety pagans. And, and he's talking to all these intellectual philosopher types, the Epicureans and the Stoics. And it's easy to see that Christ was nowhere to be found in their belief system. He didn't find Christ anywhere. 30,000 statues, nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And their response to Paul's preaching was that he was a whack job. That he was a babbler. He was a seed picker. He was a chirping gutter sparrow who went around peeping borrowed ideas. They were sarcastic about what he had to say. They had no room for this teaching that Paul was bringing to them. Their minds were absolutely shut. They were closed. They were not going to hear this. So then the crowd accompanies Paul to Mars Hill. So we have this scene in the midst of the beautiful temples that are there, the Acropolis and the Parthenon. And, and all around Paul and all these people are thousands of these idols, these statues these, of these deities, altars of gold, altars of silver and bronze. Before him was the Council of Mars, the philosopher gang, and what a showdown it would become. It was Paul against the world. Wow. Have you ever been in that situation? It was you against the crowd. You alone. That was it. What is this seed picker going to say? Well, let's find out. Point number two is the proclamation. The proclamation comes in verses 22 to 29. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now look what he says here, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands like those two up there, like the Parthenon and the Acropolis. No. Neither is worshipped with men's hands. He doesn't have statues and need that as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Paul's approach here is masterful. He takes these people where they are and tells them what they need to know. He met them where they were. He says, as I walked around your city, I came to this one altar to the unknown God. Let's focus on that for a few minutes here. He makes a brilliant application. He points to their problem. The word unknown is the root from which we get agnosticism, which means without knowledge. The Athenians were supposed to know everything, and they did almost. On the most important truth, though, they came up way short. I mean, they weren't anywhere close to the truth. They did not know that unknown God. They did not know Jesus Christ. Paul didn't say that. They said it to an unknown God. Many of those folks in the crowd probably got his irony. Now that Paul gets them over the bridge, he lays out the true spiritual doctrine. First about God and then about themselves. Let's go back and look at some of these verses again. So first about God and then about themselves, verses 24 and 25. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So the fundamental truth about God is that he is the creator. He is the creator. God gives us life. God is actively here and he seeks us out. Look at verses 26 and 7. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You, living here in Athens, this is not an accident. Nothing is an accident. You were created by God and he is seeking to have a personal relationship with you. Verses 28 and 29. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think, that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. God is not all of this 30,000 statues and altars and all of this that you have. Paul masterfully uses lines from their own poets. He keeps their attention. They're with him. The point is this. Since they were created by God, they should refrain from false worship. God created you to worship him, not all of this. Since we are made in the image of God, it is insulting to God and degrading to us to make an idol out of God. He is not this, all these statues that you have and up on the hill, your big temples of worship. This is where some people think that Paul stumbled in his presentation. Now, I'm not buying into that any longer. You know, when you think about uh, the great men of God, all of us have flaws. Did you know that? 
That lady that had that dream about me back at Lebanon Christian Academy, I was perfect as she was really off her rocker on that one. Uh Uh-uh. No. I think about great preachers that I know and that I've heard preached and, and love to hear them preach the word. I think about them and I think about their lives. Yeah, they have flaws too. Great men, yeah, they still have flaws. It's all that. Everybody does. You know, my dad used to say, you point your finger that way, you got three pointing back, buddy. That was his take on it. I think about the massive number of souls that have been won by certain evangelists that I know and have heard preach and have seen kids at the wilds coming forth in droves to get right with God and to get saved. I remember dealing with one uh, young man uh, one night. I mean, there's so, there's so many kids go out of that building to be dealt with that the counselors cannot deal with them all. So they say, all you pastors and pastor's wives, go out there, please help. So this young man came up, uh, came up to me, and I'm talking to him. And we started out with him getting right with God, and we took care of that. And then he went away, and I was dealing with another young man. And that young man came back to me, and he said, when you're done with him, can I talk to you again? I said, sure. So I finished with, with this young man, and he came back again. He said, he said look, he said, this isn't about me getting right with God. I need to be saved. I watched these great men of God preach. I watched the results of their preaching, the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they have flaws. But I also noticed this about them. I have noticed that when adverse things come into their lives, it changed them too. I've seen great men of God go through deep water and it changed their life. It made them better Christians. It got rid of some of those flaws that they had. They dealt with it, got rid of it. Now we all have to go there. We all need to go there. We all need revival. We all need to be redone, renewed in our hearts in our minds. These people in Athens, they, they weren't into any of this. I mean, pff, they were not having it at all. So Paul's address here, I believe, was very passionate. It was direct and it was personal. You need to repent. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number three, the plea. The plea comes in verses 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So there's two things these people didn't go along. They didn't go along with this man, Jesus Christ, and they surely didn't go along with his resurrection. Oh, no. What is that? They were not going to buy that. We are to repent of our idolatry. We are not to worship the works of our hands. We must repent. Why? Because judgment is coming. It is coming. Folks of Athens, we are not moving toward extinction. That is not the way it is. We are moving towards divine judgment. These philosophers were not looking to make a decision. In church, we have altar calls. Every week we do, we do it here. What happens during that time? Well, these people in Athens did not want to hear about resurrection. They did not want to hear about life after death. They said, that'll be enough for this talk. When, it, when you call for a decision, 
men begin to shift their posture and look at their watches. When the rubber meets the road, that's when the devil gets to work and says, you don't want to buy into that, do you? You don't want to experience revival. You don't want to get right with God. Just, just get through the hymn and get out of here. You see, seeing that you are accountable to the true and living God makes people very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Point number four, the product. The product, verses 32 to 34. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again of this. So Paul departed from among them. How be it? Here's the result. Certain men clave unto him. And they believed. Among whom was Dionysius the Arapagite. I apologize to you for slaughtering your name. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. So I think it's important to see the result here. It says certain men. We don't know how many, but there was a group. Among that group was this philosopher, one of those crazy people. All right? Him, Dionysius, yeah. And a woman named Damaris and others with them. So we have the product. We have three results to Paul's preaching. Number one, they mocked. That's mostly what happens. Mocked. They rejected the message. The second thing was delay. We'll hear you again later. Whether or not that happened, we don't know. That was the second thing. But then third, third and best, there was true belief. I mentioned some weeks ago a, a, a short phrase, and someone texted me that they really loved that. Prayer is never wasted. I've been living with that thought in mind ever since that person said, because I didn't even think of another thing about it. But somebody caught that and said, man, that was good. Prayer is never wasted. There was true belief here. Got to praise God because some came to saving faith. This was not a wash. Now, I can't tell you how many, how many nights I've gone out knocking on doors and it was a wash. Nobody accepted Christ as their Savior. I think the best summer we ever had, Bill Swigger and I were going out banging on doors and four people that summer confessed Christ at their front door. Other than that, it's what happens to Paul. Man, he got some. He got some in the midst of 30,000 statues and people who never heard the name Jesus before and they're, they're all about all these new things and having fun or not having fun and indulgence or not indulgence and some new other saying. In the midst of all that, he got some souls. That was the product. Now, I want to end this with some applications for us this morning. We need at to apply what we hear from God's word. So first of all, like most people today, like most Christians today, we must never hear or read God's word in a detached manner. We must pay attention to God with all of our being. We must always respond to God's word. For most Christians in America today, 
all, all they're doing is checking the box. I went to church. One more. Got it. A lot of watches get looked at. Oh man, it's almost time to get to the restaurant or whatever. We must always respond to God's word. Never be detached when you come to church. That's one. Two, as we listen attentively, we must appropriate what the Holy Spirit is giving to us. It's not the preacher. It's what's the Holy Spirit delivering here. I, the preacher, don't know what the need of your heart is, but the Holy Spirit does, and somehow he brings it through the preacher, and the preacher has no clue. Our job is to appropriate what the Holy Spirit is giving. We can't be like the Athenians. Paul preaches, they dismiss the whole thing except for a few. So the great sin of the church in America today is the dispassionate hearing of God's word. What does that do to us as Christians? If we come here and dispassionately listen and do nothing, you know what it does to us? It makes us spiritually ill spiritually sick because if i do not appropriate the things that i'm hearing from god's word and i get out there and just throw cast it all off that's i'm not getting the cure i'm not getting the medicine i'm not getting the word of god i'm getting sicker and so that's why i beat the drums the church in america has got to be revived me and you and all the church of america we need desperate revival so we must never hear or read god's word in a detached manner we should always appropriate what the holy spirit is giving to us through the word of god through the sermon through the preacher the holy spirit knows exactly what he's doing Trust him, depend on it, and run with what he gives to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. What a great book we have, the Bible. What an awesome book. We've looked at a really intense meeting. Paul against everybody else. It had to be an amazing day, an amazing time. And Father, we ask this morning you would help us as the believers of Faith Chapel, Lord, help us to take what you give us and to run with it. Help us to appropriate your truth to our hearts and our lives. We ask that you'll make it happen. We confess this morning how weak we are. We, we confess how flawed we are. We confess how much we need you. And so in our need, we ask that you would help. Help us to appropriate your word, your truth, your teaching to our life. And in making us better, it will make those out there better and even bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Deep down in our hearts, that's exactly what we want. Please make it happen for every soul here today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.